borrow from the classic films of yesterday. So Avatar is no different. Avatar replicates reoccurring themes of boy meets girl, boy falls in love with girl, boy saves girl and her people. That scene has been in movies over and over and over again. It's a timeless narrative that can be found in films such as The Last of the Mohegans. Same story. It can be found in a film called The Last Samurai. Same story. It can be found in Dances with Wolves. And it also can be found in the film Pocahontas and many, many others. There's little originality in Hollywood. These films pay homage to the magic Caucasian who has appeared in films from yesterday's Tarzan to last year's District 9. The same thing repeating itself over and over again. Avatar also pays homage to another popular Hollywood theme. And that theme is, that theme is the hero's journey. The hero's journey. I did a lecture last year talking about the hero's journey and specifically looked at um, uh, a couple of films that I'm going to reference and I related the original concept of the hero's journey back to Egypt. This story comes out of ancient Egypt. It is the story of Asar, Aset, and Heru. And Hollywood has made over a dozen pictures using this thing but they just don't reference its comedic origins. So. This theme of the hero's journey is at the core of two of the most popular trilogies, film trilogies of all time. That is Star Wars and The Matrix. Both of these films have the same theme. And that theme is it's a genre in which the hero is always a young male loner with no immediate family. He's an ideologue in search for adventure and his place in the world. And then he meets a teacher who takes him on a rite of passage. <clears throat> and as he advances through this rite of passage, as he matures, he then is defeated in combat with the enemy. And then later, he is resurrected as a Jedi Knight, he may be resurrected as the one, or he may be resurrected as the last shadow, Taruk Makto. And he saves his people, he saves the planet, he saves the universe. That's the hero, hero's journey. Timeless message. So let's look at how all of this plays in the film Avatar. James Cameron wrote Avatar as a piece of agitation propaganda. James Cameron wrote Avatar as a piece of agitation propaganda. In a December the 11th, 2009 interview in Vanity Fair, Cameron said, and I want you to, to listen to his words, read and listen to his words carefully. He said, what I was doing with Avatar was more in response to the history of the human race that has been written in blood by technically and militarily superior people taking from those who were less capable. All right, that's what he was doing. He says, I think it's important for people to see the patterns in history. He said, I think science fiction is a way of making history exciting and putting it in the future and taking it to a new planet and showing you exactly the same old stuff that's been happening for the last 2,000 years. So science fiction is a medium that's used, fantasy is a medium used to create what's referred to as cognitive dissonance, to separate you from reality and to transport you to another place so that you're more receptive to the message because it doesn't relate to you, all right? He says here, science fiction is excellent for this process because if you make a comment about the Iraqi war, and American imperialism in the Middle East, you're going to get a lot of people ticked off at you in this country. But if you do it in a science fiction context, where you do it on a metaphorical level, 
People get swept away by the story, and then they get to the end of the movie before they realize that they've been rooting for the Iraqis. <laughs> huh? That's agitation propaganda. And that was his intent. And he did it better than anybody else up to this point. So in this context, so it's in this context of agitation propaganda that I wish to analyze Avatar and to discuss its historical and cultural relevance to Africans, to Native Americans, and to any human being with a soul and a conscience. So I want to begin my analysis with a look at James Cameron, fascinating individual. James Cameron, the writer, the director, the producer, the editor of Avatar. James Cameron is a 55-year-old Canadian who is regarded as one of Hollywood's most innovative filmmakers. In 1977, he was living in California, driving a truck for a living, when he saw Star Wars and said, I want to do that. James Cameron has always said that he had a vivid imagination. And when he saw what George Lucas had put on the screen, he said, I can do that. And so he quit his job, went to college, and studied film. And over a period of years, he, he paid his dues and then began to make a name for himself in the industry. The first major film that he wrote, produced, and directed was a 1984 film called The Terminator. All right? And then he made a bigger name for himself two years later with a film called Aliens. James Cameron is the first director in Hollywood to film both a million dollar, a $100 million film when he made Terminator 2 in 1991, and he was the first filmmaker to produce a $200 million film when he produced Titanic in 1997. And he's also the first filmmaker in history to make a $300 million plus film in 2009, Avatar. So he is an innovator on so many levels. In 1996, Cameron wrote a 80-page treatment and outline for Avatar. So he's been carrying this story, I've listened to interviews of, of him, and he said he's been carrying this story in his head since he was a child. And so in 1996, he wrote the story, wrote the outline for the story, but then he had to wait 10 years because the technology wasn't available to bring his vision to the screen. And so by 2004, advances in filmmaking had evolved to the point where he was now satisfied that it's time for me to make this film. So he dusted off his outline of Avatar. He revised certain segments of the script to bring it in sync with the times. And then he set out to make this film. He had Sony design new film cameras and lenses for what he wanted to do because the technology, all the technology wasn't available. And because of the fact that he made something like $160 million off of Titanic, he had the money now to invest in himself. So he talked to executives at Sony, told him what he needed, gave them his specs, and then they created the cameras and the lenses that allowed him to do his work. He hired computer engineers to create the software that would allow him to, to render computer-generated imagery in real time. He's the first person in film history to invent this technology. He made modifications in existing image capture technology so that he could faithfully render the facial expressions of his actors in uh, of all of his CG-generated characters. So I want you to understand the workings of the mind of this person. And the, the key thing about this was that he wanted to be able to capture their expressions in a 
3D, 